Hi. So today we're going to continue talking about behaviorism and really talk about the applications of behaviorism specifically to the classroom. So, so our first um, application to the classroom should be, um, we'll be thinking about how do we measure behavior and what interventions could we use um, to increase or decrease behavior inside and outside of the classroom. And you can see right on the left, we have a behavior chart, which is my least favorite way to um, encourage or discourage behavior in the classroom. And I'm just gonna go on my soapbox for a minute here and talk about the problems with behavior charts we use in classrooms. Um, the first problem that I think is with a behavior chart that's public in a classroom is that's really a violation of FERPA. Um, in that this is private information about how a kid's performing in school, and we have now made it public. We've put it out in where everyone who walks by, every parent, every visitor to the classroom can see how a child is doing on any given day and how their behavior is. And, you know, that's, that's not necessarily information that everyone needs to have, but that should be private between a child and a teacher and the child's parents. In addition, I think that it creates anxiety and um, problems around behavior and unintentional consequences when we make it such a public display of behavior and it creates embarrassment. Um, it erodes um, relationships between students and teachers. And I think that there are just better ways to reinforce um, behaviors besides this public display of um, accountability for behaviors. So okay, there's my two cents on behavior charts. So let's talk about um, the first thing is um, how do we measure behaviors and how do we how do we get data on this? And the first thing that we have to think about is what behavior we're going to measure. So whether that in the classroom is sitting down, raising our hands. Um, whatever we call participation, eye contact, um, whatever behavior it is, um, answering questions right on a test. Um, and then we have to think about um, how do we operationalize that? How do we make that behavior and how do we measure it? So if I want to say, um, raising our hand, um, if I want to encourage that behavior, then I have to think about, okay, so is it enough that they raise their hand? Do they also have to have a relevant comment when I call on them? Um, if it's participation, does that mean saying anything in class? Does it mean um, behaving appropriately? Does it mean um, contributing meaningfully to the discussion? So whatever the behavior is, we also have to take a little bit to think about what does that mean? How do we, how are we going to define what that behavior is? And even if it sounds a little silly to say, well, when I say raising their hand, I mean, that means putting the hand in the air. But you'd be surprised about how Sometimes it really is important that we define that behavior. So think about that and what that behavior means. And um, then we have to think about how we're going to collect the data. So there's lots of ways that the teachers collect data about our behavior. Sometimes it's a checklist of a couple of different types of behaviors that we might ask kids to do. So, you know, in the mornings, have they, you know, we might have a checklist of did they, um, put it put their folder in the basket did they put their backpack on the shelf did they um, sit in their desk did they write their name on their paper there might be a list of things that so we have a checklist of things um, there might be a log of behaviors so it might be a log of how many books they've read or a log of the centers that they've met and that might be on a daily weekly monthly yearly basis um, we could have things like um, a frequency chart or a time on task chart where we're keeping track of those. And that's where we get into frequency, duration, and time sampling. And these are really um, methodical ways where we could collect really consistent data about a kid's behaviors. Um, so I'm going to define each of these sampling behaviors um, techniques because it's important that we kind of think about how we measure behaviors if we're going to think about um, how we could influence them. So frequency sampling is really how often a behavior happens. And this is probably the most common way that we might be measuring behavior. So for example, um, over the course of 30 minutes, how many times does Sarah get out of her seat? Um, how many times does Julian raise his hand? How many times does, um, does my boyfriend check his phone, right? Those kinds of things. And the next one is duration sampling, and that's for a behavior that lasts the amount of time. So we might say, how long does Sammy read before he gets up and watches TV? How long can um, Steven go without checking his phone? How long does um, my two-year-old's tantrum last? 
right? So if, it, if it's a behavior that lasts time, and it's not something that's, that um, is a short, that you know, we could count, we might think about duration. Um, and then finally, we have time sampling. And this one is, um, this one's really systematic. I like using it um, when it's something that could be frequent or last a duration. So for example, um, if I was going to measure if a child's on or off task, and this is actually really common if we were going to think about students with ADHD, perhaps. So I could, um, in 30 minutes, I could every 30 seconds take a look at Julia and just mark whether or not she's on task or off task. And then after 30 minutes, I could say, okay, so, um, you know, based upon these 60 observations I had, Julia was off task maybe 50% of the time, and that would give me information about her attention or her, you know, and whether or not I should move forward. So time sampling is um, another way to collect behaviors. So you want to think about what your behavior is and which of these sampling techniques makes the most sense. Um, and then we can think about once we know what behavior we're targeting and how we're going to measure it, then we want to think about how can I do an intervention? How could I change this behavior? How could I use the theory of behaviorism to change my subject's behavior? So we can associate behaviors, and that's classical conditioning, right? So if I want to, um, if I want to get them to, you know, hate white rabbits, then I could associate a loud noise with that, right? If I want to um, to get their attention, um, I can, you know, I could do something. I could um, associate something pleasant with this activity that I want them to do, right? Um, if I want them to like me, I could always bring cookies. And then if they like cookies, then I'm bringing them the cookies. Maybe they will like me, right? Um, I could also think about increasing a behavior that I want to encourage. So if I, and remember, positive reinforcement is the most powerful way that we have to influence behavior, right? So if I want to increase um, the amount of time that my students um, raise their hands, I could give them a piece of candy every time they raise their hand, right? That would be a very simple intervention I could do. Um, or I could, if I want to decrease the behavior, right? So if I want to decrease the number of times that my boyfriend checks his phone while he's talking to me, right, I could um, give him an electrical shock every time that he checks his phone. Now, that's a bad idea because that's not very ethical, right? I can think about um, a punishment every time that they do a behavior, or I could take something away that, that they'd like, right? So I could take away a minute of recess every time that um, my student um, gets out of a seat. Okay, so think about this again, applying to the classroom, and here's, you know, a funny Far Side cartoon. I don't know if you guys ever, like, looked at Far Side um, cartoons when you were little, but um, this one says, unbeknownst to most students of psychology, Pavlov's first experiment was to ring a bell and cause his dog to attack for its cat. Some psychology humor for you. So um, encouraging behaviors, we have a carrot on a stick, right? So when we're encouraging, we're trying to reward behaviors, right? Um, thinking about teacher attention as a reinforcement. So sometimes we are reinforcing behaviors that we don't necessarily want to, right? Um, so sometimes we use teacher, sometimes kids are, are doing behaviors that are negative in order to get teachers attention, right? And then we're reinforcing that by giving them attention. So we want to think first off of, of the kid's motivation and why they might be doing something and how that would fit into a behaviorist construct. Um, but then we can also think about how we use um, reinforcement to encourage behaviors and think about genuine accomplishment. So setting our standards and our praise. So if we just say good job and we say good job, good job, good job, good job, good job, um, it starts to lose meaning, right? And it's not very specific. So we do know that specific praise um, is important um, to influencing behaviors and that that praise should be normative not to a class, but to a child. So when and associated with effort, not necessarily their, um, what they accomplished. So when a child puts forth a lot of effort, that's what we want to praise because that will change the behavior, right? Not necessarily the outcome. So if they put in a lot of effort, um, even if it didn't turn out good, we want to encourage that effort if that's the behavior we want to encourage, right? 
and we want to encourage specifically what they did correctly or what they did that we want to, them to continue. So saying good job to everyone isn't very much of a reinforcement. Instead, we want to say, Sally, I'm really proud of the way that you consistently and persisted on that math problem, even though it's really hard. I like how you carried the tens digit when you were multiplying fractions. Okay, I know that's not how you multiply fractions. I was coming up with an example off the top of my head. Do you get the idea? I'm being very specific in my praise. I'm telling Sally what she did, and I'm thinking about the behavior that she did, not just a general, general thing. When we're thinking about reinforcements, we can also think about how we select them. The Pramat principle is, if you do this now, then later we can do this. It's that promise of a preferred activity um, to ensure engagement of a less fun activity. So saying things like, you know, if we can get through our math homework now, then later we can watch a movie. If we can eat our broccoli now, we can have a cookie later, right? We use this all the time. Um, and thinking about how we letting our students um, have that delayed gratification, right? And then thinking about what reinforcement works for which students, right? So not everybody's motivated by the same things, right? So thinking about each of our individual students and what motivates them specifically. And that can get really complicated because, um, again, we're teaching, you know, you know, anywhere from 16 to 32 individual learners, and they all might be motivated by something different. So you want to think about um, how we can encourage those behaviors for each of our students separately. Now we have it coping with undesirable behaviors, and that's um, maybe even more difficult And as we're thinking about classroom management strategies. Um, it's sure it's great to encourage positive behaviors, but a lot of times we're stuck with thinking about when there's a situation where there's a negative behavior and undesirable behavior, what do we do to discourage that from happening again? Um, so negative reinforcement is an opportunity for escape. So um, if you don't finish this in class, you have to work through resource, recess. It's not really a punishment um, because the desired behavior is completing the, completing the work as, as reinforced. So rather than saying stop talking, if you keep talking, I'm going to make you sit out of recess, you're saying I want you to keep working. So now you're encouraging a behavior rather than trying to discourage a behavior. So if you can think about um, what's happening in the classroom in terms of what you'd like the students to do instead of what you want them not to do, you'll be in a better situation, right? Um, and then um, and then we can talk about satiation, and this is really um, requiring them to repeat a problem behavior past the point of motivation. And it's really probably a bad idea. Um, it can be extreme, used with extreme caution. It's like this idea of like making um, the kids smoke, you know, cigarettes until they can just stop smoke until they're just so tired of it and they get really sick. Um, the problem is that kids um, have are amazingly stubborn. I don't know if you know this or not, but they are so stubborn and lots of times their will might actually outlast yours. So only do this if you think, if you know, you know that you can outlast the students. Um, so you can use a reprimand, which is a criticism of misbehavior rebuke. Um, and if we're going to reprimand a student, and we often have to, right, we want to make sure that's private, that we're, um, that we're doing that in a way that's respectful for the students so that we can maintain that relationship with the student. Um, and that's, again, that kind of goes back to my discussion of the um, behavior charts, right? Um, the response cost. Um, punishment by loss of reinforcers. So if you lose recess, if you pay a fine, if you have to give up something, um, that's a response cost. That's what ha that's a consequence for your behavior. You give up something that you had previously earned. Um, and in social isolation, something like timeout, removal of disruptive students. Um, this works only if the student is a social person and wants to be around. So it only works as a, as a punishment right, as, as to decrease the behavior if the student finds it as something undesirable. So sometimes students act out and they put themselves in that situation because they want to be removed from the classroom. And sometimes the message that we're giving is, um, is that is not a great message, right? Um, although 
the other thing to think about outside of a behaviorist standpoint is that when we are giving kids time out, we might also just be giving them a time to rest, reflect, and gather themselves. And sometimes we all need a time out to, to do that. So um, it's how you frame it. If we're framing it as a punishment as a way to stop a behavior, then we want to make sure that it's actually something that is undesirable to the student. So thinking about warnings and ethics here with trying to stop behaviors through behaviorism, um, be careful. Um, punishment doesn't lead to a desirable behavior. So when we punish kids, we're not necessarily giving them the skills um, that they need to, um, to change or to do something more positive. Um, it stops the behavior, but harsh punishments can lead to retaliation and anger and resentment, and it doesn't help us build relationships. So in general, we want to stay away from punishments, um, but, I also, but we also know that sometimes it's important to have consequences for behaviors. Um, so for example, is it right to make a student clean gum off the bottom of a desk? Um, require 100 push-ups for talking in line? Reduce a student's grade for late work or cheating. And I think we can all think of examples where this might have happened to a friend of ours or you've done as a teacher or you've experienced as a student. And um, I want you to think about the ethical reasons why these may or may not be appropriate um, for you as a teacher or when we think about behaviorism. Um, and do we have other options? Are there other ways that we could deal with these behaviors as teachers rather than using punishments? Are there ways that we could use positive reinforcement? Are there ways that we could change this behavior um, to do something more positive that would have maybe a more lasting impact for students? And finally, I want to talk a little bit about behaviorism and learning. We've talked a lot about changes in behavior as far as classroom management, but I want to talk a little bit about the academic side of this um, learning theory. And I want to think about how it fits into our current accountability system. And when I say accountability system, I'm thinking about the FSAs and our state, our state um, testing situations. Um, and how might that fit into behaviorism? So first off, um, if we think about learning as a change in behavior, we're really thinking about learning specifically as a change in observable test scores. And we think about in this, in this accountability system, we're not thinking about learning as what's happening in a classroom. We're not looking at any other evidence of learning except for that standardized test score. So we're not looking at um, teaching um, in a classroom. We're not looking at a portfolio system. We're not trying to see what a kid can do except for that change in behavior, which is measured only by a test score. So in that sense, it really is behaviorist thinking. Um, and then we think about how are we how are we changing behaviors? How are we changing those test scores? And it's really through um, a system of rewards and punishments, right? So if a school does well, they get an A, they get a gold star, they get, you know, condemnation or you know, they get rewards from the state. Um, and what happens if a student fails, right? They don't, they don't get to move on. They, they are held back from their grade level. What happens if a teacher, if a teacher students don't do well? Right. She she might lose her job. He or she might lose her job. That there's consequences for that. If the teacher students do well, they might get a bonus. Right. And same for a school. Ultimately, if a school um, receives a failing grade for too many years, they might even be shut down. So there's extreme rewards and punishments for schools under this accountability system. So we might think about our schools accountability systems and testing under this theory of behaviorism. So this lecture was really all about how, um, how we can apply the theories of behaviorism to our classrooms and to our lives and what that might look like. So again, if you have any questions about this, please contact me. I'm available through email. We can set up a time to talk on the phone or in person in my office. I'll be happy to work with you and help you develop your understanding of behaviorism. Have a great day. Bye.